Okay guys, we are going to get started here. So if you could take a seat and get yourselves ready and, our, and help me introduce our next speaker, uh, Robert LaPrairie, who is here to talk about the ABCs on THC. Hi everyone, don't mind me, I'm just trying to make sure this is, is working. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Mostly? Hang on. I usually end up fighting with this thing. I teach in this classroom Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the spring, or I guess winter semester, starting in January. And I either find that I can't get the mic to work or it ends up scratching my beard for the whole hour and then everyone's just, <laughs> just irritated with me. So, uh, my name is Robert LaPrairie. I am a professor of pharmacology in the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition right here in this building. This is where I live. Um, I don't sleep here, but I tend to work a lot, so you can find me here most of the time. I am not a physician by training. I'm a molecular pharmacologist, which means I study how drugs work in the body. And for the past eight or nine years, I've been focused on how cannabinoids work in the human body and discovering how they might be useful or not as drugs. So that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Um, just for clarification, I always like to say right at the beginning, I'm not a physician and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't prescribe and I can't provide any sort of legal advice. Sorry. Um, I also do, full disclosure, receive some of my funding for my research here on campus through Canamed Therapeutics. All right. So, this is what we're going to be talking about today. We'll talk about what a cannabinoid is. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the, on the internet, in the literature, about what a cannabinoid is and what it does. Um, I don't know if the person from uh, Medical Access Cannabis is here, but I want to credit you guys for doing a good job on your uh, little leaflet that you left out on the table. It's nice. Um, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. And then we'll talk about your body's own cannabinoid system, what I call the endocannabinoid system. Then we're going to get into a little bit about cannabinoids as drugs where they're useful, where they aren't, and really, and I want to drive this home, where the evidence is lacking. Then we'll get into chronic pain a little bit, and we'll finish by talking about where this applies to the endometriosis field. Maybe. Ah. So this I just like to open with, the increasing popularity of cannabinoids. So these graphs both show the number of scientific articles published on cannabinoids since cannabinoids were discovered chemically. So THC, the thing in cannabis that makes us high, was first discovered in 1964 by an Israeli scientist named Rafi Meshulam. From there, we start to see a number of scientific studies getting published, and you can see that it's just growing and growing and growing. Um, some other important dates. In 1991, we found out that humans have a receptor for cannabinoids. It's called CB1, or the type 1 cannabinoid receptor. Our bodies also make their own cannabinoids. They're called anandamide, which comes from the Sanskrit word for bliss, and 2-arachidonoglycerol, so AEA and 2-AG. We have a second cannabinoid receptor, CB2, because scientists like to name things in sequential order. CB2 is involved in inflammatory responses. We have this drug here called Romanabont. I'm going to get into that in a little while because I think it's a really interesting story about cannabinoids as drugs. And then only last year was the structure, the physical structure of what the human cannabinoid receptor looks like determined. So this is really recent and it's um, quite new and young in comparison to other drug fields. And then on the bottom here are some different studies published, the number of studies published in the context of pain and cannabinoids or endometriosis and cannabinoids. And you can see that there are a lot fewer. So, you know, this graph tops out at 80, whereas this one's topping out at 1,500. So what's a cannabinoid? So a cannabinoid is any compound, any drug, any molecule, structurally or functionally related to THC. You can have endogenous cannabinoids. You can have phytocannabinoids, which means it comes from a plant. 
and you can have synthetic cannabinoids made in a lab to help us understand cannabinoid biology. To date, there have been over 120 cannabinoids isolated from the plant. We really only know how two of those work, and I'll get into those in a little bit. THC is the most abundant and the best characterized, followed by cannabidiol. I have some of their structures over here on the left and how they're found in their relative ratios in the plant, generally speaking. It's going to vary from plant type to plant type. THC, we know, activates these CB1 and CB2 receptors. And it's that activation that produces the high, produces the munchies, the appetite stimulation, reduces anxiety, and modulates pain. CB2 also activates, or sorry, THC also activates CB2, and that's where we get the anti-inflammatory effects. Cannabidiol seems to mediate a lot of different effects, including reducing anxiety, as well as maybe modulating pain and modulating uh, seizures in epilepsy, but we don't know how. This is an intimidating figure, but don't worry. You're not getting tested on this. If you were my students during the semester, you would be getting tested on this. So just you know, count yourself lucky, I guess. Um, what I'm showing here are two neurons in the brain. Our blue neuron is what we call our presynaptic neuron, and our orange neuron is what we call our postsynaptic neuron. When a neuron is activated, an electrical signal will flow from this neuron down and will cause the blue neuron to release neurotransmitter, our little blue bubbles, out across what we call the synaptic cleft into our orange neuron. That orange neuron will then be activated and something will happen. Cannabinoids are unique in that they function in what we call a retroactive direction. So rather than signaling from top to bottom, once this orange neuron gets activated, it's going to make endocannabinoids. And it's going to send those endocannabinoids back to the blue neuron and say, stop, slow down, release less neurotransmitter. By doing that, endocannabinoids and any cannabinoid that goes into the body functions as a molecular brake to slow down synaptic transmission. And that's going to be key when we talk about some of the other ways that cannabinoids are working. So when we think about specifically cannabinoid act activation in neurons, we're talking about a molecular breaking mechanism. Now up here in the top, we have our microglia and it has CB2. So microglia are inflammatory cells. They're like the white blood cells of our brain. CB2 in the context of microglia and white blood cells is going to limit inflammatory signals. So it's going to suppress inflammation. But the mechanism is very similar. OK, so we have, like I said, a lot of different cannabinoid molecules. We have our endocannabinoids over here on the left. We have two arachidonyl glycerol and anandamide. Excuse me. We also have plant-based cannabinoids. Cannabidiol, which has complex pharmacology that's still being worked out. And THC, which is a CB1 and CB2 partial agonist, which means it turns the receptor on. Then we have a lot of synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists. These are compounds that were synthesized in a lab to help us understand how cannabinoids work. They're usually used as study compounds, but in the last five or six years, they have appeared on the illicit market um, as substances of abuse, and you'll commonly see them referred to in the news as spice or K2, or bath salts sometimes. So these are synthetic cannabinoids that work through the same pathway, but they're much more potent and much more prone to producing side effects. So where are these receptors in your body? So CB1 is the most abundant receptor that you have in your brain. It is expressed at high levels in areas of your brain that are responsible for everything from decision making and emotional behavior to learning and memory, as well as voluntary movement, stress and emotion, body temperature and feeding, so appetite, as well as motor coordination and control. Because it has so many different functions in the brain, this is why you often see cannabinoids touted as a cure for many different things, or a treatment for many different things. But the evidence, as we'll get into, isn't necessarily there. 
CB2, on the other hand, is expressed primarily on white blood cells and inflammatory cells, again, to regulate that inflammatory response. So the picture I just showed you was an adult brain, but our brains change as we age and we grow. One of the key things that CB1 does as we age is it's involved in the what we call synaptic repair and pruning. In the developing adolescent brain, this means that the cannabinoid receptors have a very important role to play in forming those synapses between new neurons. And if we look at the developing brain starting in mid to late embryonic development all the way up to adulthood, and we think of dark green as being lots of CB1 and light green as being less CB1, what we can see is that the distribution of the receptor changes over time. In adolescence in particular, you have a whole lot of CB1 through this area, the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is really important in decision making. It's our executive function center. That's the part of your brain at where as a teenager, if you decide, should I jump off this roof into this pool, that part of your brain hasn't finished developing yet, so you jump off the roof into the pool. Now, I like to ask people this. At what point did your brain become an adult brain? 25. 25? Anybody else? 25 is the best guess that we have right now. So your prefrontal cortex finishes developing when you're about 25 years old, for reference. This means that things like exogenous plant-derived cannabinoids, particular THC, may have detrimental effects on the development of the prefrontal cortex and may elicit some psychiatric disorders in those patients who have exposed themselves to THC before their brain has finished maturing. So let's just emphasize the key physiological roles for cannabinoids. Memory, voluntary movement, stress and anxiety, like if you're delivering a presentation to a bunch of people you've never met before, appetite and metabolism, temperature, and for today, pain perception. The other thing that I want to talk about that people often ask me about, so I just put this in here, is what we call pharmacokinetics. So where does the drug go once it's in your body? So when THC in particular is ingested, it's metabolized or transformed into this compound called 11-hydroxy-THC. Both THC and 11-hydroxy-THC have effects on the brain, and they both cause both changes in pain perception as well as that high that you receive. There's then an additional transformation step to 11-carboxy-THC, and that does not have, th have stimulatory or um, anxiolytic effects, and it's excreted from the body. Something that's come up a lot recently in the study of cannabinoids as medicine is what we call the entourage effect. So earlier I talked about how there's at least 120 cannabinoids present in cannabis. Well, what we don't know and what we're trying to figure out is whether or not that unique combination of compounds has an effect or if it's really all being driven by the THC and the cannabidiol. So how much do the terpenes affect this process? How much do all the other cannabinoids affect this process? Unfortunately, we don't know. We don't know if those interactions are beneficial, harmful, neutral, synergistic, or even if they matter at all. We also, as scientists, struggle with this question because typically what a scientist will do when, it, when we ask a question is we do something called reductionism. So we study the smallest number of variables possible in order to answer a question. And it becomes very difficult to answer or solve a hypothesis when you're dealing with a mixture of 120 different variables that change as a function of the plant and the species. So let's get into drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Cannabinoids have been touted as treatments for a number of different things. Unfortunately, a lot of the evidence that's out there in the scientific literature and otherwise on the internet is either anecdotal or underpowered, which means that there are too few study subjects in a given trial to draw reliable conclusions. 
The studies may lack blinding, which means the patients are aware of the compound they're taking and the placebo effect could drive any response. The compounds, or sorry, the patient population themselves tend to be quite heterogeneous. This is particularly important when we think about pain. Often studies will look at chronic pain in the context of cannabinoids and include people who suffer from endometriosis pain, as well as osteoarthritic pain, as well as fibromyalgia. And those pain modalities are different, and therefore it is inappropriate to lump everybody together and assume my pain is your pain is their pain. But this is often done in order to increase power. And then finally, the studies often suffer from heterogeneity of substance abuse. This was talked of, sorry, substance use and route of administration. This was mentioned in an earlier talk today. If someone is smoking a vaporized cannabis product, it is not the same as if they are ingesting an oil product. It is not the same if they are using a skin patch or cream. These are all different ways that the drug is entering the body. Also, if I were using a smoked product from one plant, I cannot equate that to a smoked product from a different plant that might have a different ratio of cannabinoids in it and is therefore a different drug. So these sorts of things make studying cannabinoids very challenging. So that's where I want to get into this. I think this is a really interesting story, and it's kind of an aside to what we've been talking about before. <coughs> so has anybody heard of this drug, Romanabont or Acomplia? So Romanabont, if you've already read the slide, it's spoilers, was released in the European Union as a drug to help treat obesity. Um, it worked really well for what its goal was. If you were on 10 milligrams of Romanabont a day, you could expect to lose 2 kilograms of body mass per week without diet or exercise. Sounds pretty good, except that the major side effect was suicidal ideation and depression. For this reason, Romanabont was removed from the market in the European Union and never saw the light of day in Canada or the US. <clears throat> Makes sense, right? Romanabont worked by blocking or reversing the signaling of the type 1 cannabinoid receptor. Think of it as the unmunchies. You're going to block that response entirely. It worked really well, like I said, for what it was supposed to do, but it had these awful side effects. So when someone asks you, have cannabinoids ever been developed as, pain, as drugs, you can say, yes, there's at least one good example, but it didn't turn out. So what about cannabinoids for pain? So remember several slides ago, I talked about this molecular breaking mechanism. We're going to slow down signaling through the neurons. Well, CB1 receptors are located along those pain processing pathways in your spinal column. So, as well as in nociceptors in the skin and peripheral terminals. At the synapses, those CB1 receptors modulate pain processes and slow down the pain signals that would be traveling through the spinal column. And in that way, it's thought that cannabinoids modulate your perception of pain. Go back. So, to date, there have been 82 randomized control trials for pain. Like I said before, there's a whole gamut of different indications for the types of pain that were studied. So, some cases of fibromyalgia, chronic neuropathic pain, diabetic neuropathies, rheumatoid arthritis, the list goes on and on. As it currently stands, the stance of most medical agencies in Canada will say that for acute pain, such as after surgery, cannabinoids may be effective as a third-line treatment. This means you've tried at least two things and they haven't worked for you. If you go and ask your doctor for a script for cannabis to treat pain, they will, if they're willing, be able to consult and provide that script for you. Um, but it is considered by the current guidelines as a third-line treatment. For chronic pain, there's moderate quality evidence that it treats pain reliably, but never as a first-line therapy. 
So the current recommendation is that you must have failed to have successful treatment with at least one other standard painkiller. And then specifically for rheumatic diseases and fibro, um, there's insufficient evidence to recommend its use. And the reasons for that aren't known, I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, and are not well studied. I would definitely say work in progress and more work needs to be done. And I would apply that statement generally to the field of cannabinoids in the clinic. <coughs> excuse me. I also wanted to highlight two different pieces of information here just to kind of unpack the cultural shift that we're going through. So the Canadian Medical Association guideline currently states that the Canadian Medical Association is hoping to work with the government to eliminate the existing framework for medicinal access to cannabis as soon as possible. The CMA's goal is that everyone would be able to access cannabis purely through recreational means rather than separate streams of medicinal versus recreational. The Canadian Pharmacists Association has taken the opposite tact and is working to, to acquire either drug identifier numbers or natural health product numbers for cannabis in the hopes that one day cannabis products can be acquired through insurance or covered through insurance and then more research can be done on their um, implications and utility as medicine. I don't want to show my bias too much, but I also work in a school of pharmacy, so, you know. Um, <laughs> the CPHA has also developed these awesome continuing education credits. So if you know anyone that's a pharmacist, they can get CE credit for studying um, basically what I'm talking to you guys about today, how the cannabinoid system works and evidence around cannabis as medicine. So this brings us to endometriosis specifically. Uh, last week and the week before, I've been combing the literature trying to find any clinical work that's been published in the context of endometriosis, pain, and cannabis. No published data currently exists for the management of endometriosis with cannabis or cannabinoid products in people. There is evidence in preclinical animal models of endometriosis to suggest that there could be benefit. And that's what this talks about. So CB1, our receptor of choice, is present on the neurons that innervate um, endometrial growths, which is interesting. CB1 receptor agonists, so these are things that turn on the receptor, uh, tend to decrease. So your endogenous cannabinoid levels drop off. And CB1 receptor antagonists increase endometriosis-associated hyperalgesia, so the pain associated with endometriosis. It's also been shown that CB1 agonists reduce cell proliferation, but they can also increase cell migration, so there's a tough little balance there. And what I actually found most interesting was that there's really good evidence to show that the levels of the receptor itself track with the levels of progesterone uh, during the normal cycle, but in endometriosis, that normal cycling of CB1 levels actually goes flat. So a receptor that's typically responsible for coordinating some of that uh, growth and pain response goes completely flat, and it seems like um, these agonists, so CB1 agonists like THC, might be beneficial in treating the hyper, uh, hyperalgesia associated with endometriosis pain. But again, preclinical animal models, we don't know yet in humans. So that brings me to something that I think is really important, which is CRIS. So CRIS is the Cannabinoid Research Initiative of Saskatchewan. Um, our goal is to be able to form this interdisciplinary team of scientists. We currently have 45 scientists working here on campus that are all looking at different aspects of cannabinoids both as medicine and as an agricultural product. What we want to do is filter anecdotes to provide evidence-based medicine uh, for cannabis and we're moving along pretty well. And the reason I link this up with this previous slide is because there are researchers here on campus that are trying to design clinical trials to answer the question of whether or not cannabis products would be useful in the treatment of endometrial pain. 
and hopefully we'll be able to get those trials online within the next year or so. We are also hosting a workshop. The workshop is going to be on August 16th and 17th in Marquis Hall, which is just over there by the bowl. The workshop is aimed at providing knowledge translation opportunities for healthcare providers so that they can come and again filter these anecdotes to provide evidence-based medicine. We're going to be working in conjunction with the Canadian Pharmacists Association as well as several other bodies to kind of provide this uh, opportunity for healthcare providers to learn and to work together. So we've been very fortunate here at the U of S. The administration is extremely supportive of the work we're doing. It's unlike anywhere else in Canada that I'm aware of. I have never had a single barrier while working here to doing this research. And we've had a lot of support from all of these great people and organizations. Um, I always like to wrap up quicker than I'm scheduled to because I found in the past that people have lots of questions. So with that, I'll leave it open to you guys to ask questions. So that's the question, if anyone couldn't hear, do you get THC when you consume in raw form? So in the plant, THC and cannabidiol are present as, present as THCA and CBDA. So these are the acid variants, and it's the heating of those products that causes them to convert to THC and CBD. So unless the product is being heated in some way first, you would not necessarily see the same medicinal effect. Yeah. So with no current or no studies that are showing the effects of using cannabis to treat Yeah, so um, we have a research faculty right here on campus that sub I believe has submitted um, Health Canada approval for a trial to happen at RUH beginning in the fall. Um, so, and hopefully that study will include, in order to get our numbers up, will include sites at uh, Winnipeg and Regina as well. So we'll have to expand because we don't want to avoid the mistakes of the past. One of the errors I talked about was studies being notoriously underpowered. We'd like to have lots of participants. Um, um, so we have been fortunate in that we received a good chunk of money from the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation, as well as private donations that occurred through the um, Jim Pattison Children's Hospital Foundation. And then looking forward, we're working with a couple of other licensed providers as well as the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Now, how we do our funding is a little bit different. We request that if you're a company, it's all gone now. Oh, I'm back. Um, if you're a company that's interested in funding our research, you have to provide it as a donation through an institution so that you as a company have no say in how the research goes down. So that, that, that protection bias, then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, question. Sorry, no good. So the major difference there is a best guess based on route of administration. So if I ingest something as an oil, the drug has to pass through my GI tract and then get metabolized by my liver, and my liver is going to destroy a lot of that active drug. But if I inhale something, it's going to go straight to my lungs and bypass that first liver metabolism. So I can afford to go a little bit lower on my dose and see the same effect. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of it at this point is kind of a, a best guess. So one of the slides that I'm just going to jump back to here. Come on, you can do it. Yeah. Um, this talks about how what happens to the drug in the body. So what does the body do to the drug? Um, we know almost nothing about how your body metabolizes cannabinoids. We don't know um, where it partitions to in terms of how much gets into the brain versus the gut versus the fat and all these different places. And that's very much a work in progress. Um, so once we have that you know, better worked out, it'll be just like any other pharmaceutical. And we'll say, for this effect, you need 40 milligrams, let's say. Um, in addition to the endometrial pain study that I mentioned, we have approval to run two pharmacokinetic trials in our children, like our pediatric population right now, because we're trying to work out dosing for epilepsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the back. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So it depends on which pain medication you're on. If you're, say, let's say you're taking an NSAID, like, um, so ibuprofen would be an, an NSAID example, then you would be able to do both simultaneously. If you're taking an opioid, uh, then you'd have to taper down and then add on cannabin cannabinoid oil on top of that. And that would be a discussion to have with your physician about where to kind of match that. Um, and then for other kind of less commonly used or second line therapeutics like gabapentin or um, SSRIs, amitriptyline, uh, TCAs for pain, you would have to come completely off and then start on the cannabinoid therapy. Um, but there's actually really good evidence now showing for opioids that if you're on an opioid and a cannabinoid at the same time, that they seem to help each other out. They work through that same spinal pain pathway. So what you would get from, say, 100 milligrams, and I'm just pulling these numbers out of the air, 100 milligrams of an opioid um, would be less than the re relief you would get with 50 milligrams of an opioid plus 50 milligrams of a cannabinoid. So right now, within medicinal marijuana or cannabis access, if you purchase through a licensed producer, they're required to declare what content the cannabidiol and the THC are. Um, when we go towards a natural product or a drug identification number, what will probably happen is you'll see set concentrations on the market. So there'll be like a 1 to 1 and a 1 to 5 and a 1 to 20 um, that will just be available as standard products. But that doesn't mean that everyone's response will still be the same, right? If I take morphine for my pain, it's going to be different from my wife's response to morphine. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think that that part will go away. I think that's been established. The one thing that we might see going forward is right now, according to Health Canada, you only have to declare your THC and your cannabidiol. 
But as we learn more about all those other cannabinoids, Health Canada will probably require that you declare your CBG and you declare your CBC and all those things. So, yeah, yeah, it is. No, so we, we haven't even started enrolling. Um, so I would suggest just talking to your physician about it, or if you see a specialist, talk to them about it. We're still waiting on the government to get back to us and give us a check mark. Um, unfortunately, these things take a long time. That's an open-ended question. So um, specifically, one of the indications we're looking at in the trial is a um, cannabinoid oil suppository that would be delivered rather than ingested. Um, but I know from past experience with other trials in other indications, so for example, in our epilepsy trial, you were excluded automatically if you had used cannabis previously. And that's just how it worked. I don't know what specifically this will look like going forward. Mm -hmm. Have there been studies on you know, what happens if you're taking this for your pregnant or long term? N so, not human studies. Um, in animal studies, when uh, mother rats and mice were fed cannabinoids, there was a cognitive deficit observed in the children. And that's because, really, you can think of that, that neuromodulatory effect, right? You're inhibiting synapse formation. Um, so that's been demonstrated in animals. Um, yeah, we don't know in, in people. It's hard to study these things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit ignorant when it comes to all of this stuff. Um, so you've talked about how it works with pain receptors and helps with pain. But what about nausea? How does that mm. work? Like, I know you care about cancer patients and stuff and helping with their nausea. And mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, right here is your dorsal vagal complex. It's in the back in your uh, brainstem. It mediates your emesis response. So that's your, your need to vomit, basically. And it also controls your nausea, more or less, along with the inner ear. THC at low doses seems to decrease nausea. So there's a, an anti-emetic effect. And it does seem to help with nausea. And that's been shown specifically in patients with either late stage AIDS or cancer. Um, that, that does make you high. Yeah. Yeah. So THC makes you high, cannabidiol does not. Um, at high doses, though, THC does the opposite. So you'll hear of people taking really high doses of THC or really high doses of synthetic cannabinoids like K2 or spice, and they have what's called hyperemetic syndrome, which means they basically vomit until they're so dehydrated they pass out. So there's a, it's, we call it a U-shaped dose response. At low doses, one effect. At high doses, the opposite. Yeah. Thank you. One question. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's not something that we are looking at specifically, but there is a company based out of Scotland called GW Pharma that's currently investigating that. Um, so, and specifically for both us and this other company, they're looking at just cannabidiol. Yeah. interesting what you said about um, the unknown with the THC and uh, endometriosis mm -hmm. because for me myself I have definitely noticed that I need both mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know that interested me the great thing about uh, our support group is there are some uh, very practiced and experienced cannabis users as well to reach out to so um, along with Chris and uh, the research that Robert gave us today uh, 
you guys are not alone. It's a lot of information to take in, so don't stress out too much. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thanks. Uh, so thank you guys and we're going to welcome, help me please help me welcome Joanne Fisher from uh, who is going to talk to us about Body Talk today. Okay, can you guys hear me good with that? All right. So Joanne Fisher, very recently Joanne Yankee, so you'll notice some of the cards and stuff you may have picked up say Yankee, so it's still in the midst of changing everything. Um, I'm a U of S alumni from the College of Kinesiology with a minor in psychology and I've been a yoga teacher the last 11 years so by talk has been a relatively new field for me for the last four years and um, in my yoga days I in seven of the last years on and off I taught a yoga for fertility class which uh, incorporated a lot of work in uh, endometriosis and PCOS and other feminine um, issues with that, with the fertility work. So that's kind of how I got involved in doing a lot of that. And I work a lot in the prenatal fertility realm and families. So that one's forward. There you go. So um, here's a little quote from Dr. Oz. So that um, energy and the use of energy and healing will be the biggest frontier in medicine over the next decade. The reason for that is if you think about a cell and what defines life at the level of the cell, that it's all about the energy on the inside and the outside being different. That defines life. But because we can't measure that in medicine, we are hesitant to think about tapping into it. So energy medicine is the fastest growing modality out there right now um, and lots of science um, bases out of it. So another one that we have is that the biology of it, studies being done in Russia, that DNA, DNA can actually be influenced, reprogrammed by words and frequencies without cutting or replacing cells. So if you've seen the water um, things, or there was one uh, TED talk I seen where they had a plant and they had speakers in it and they said negative bullying this plant and the plant died and another plant where the, they got um, positive words and positive reinforcement and the plant thrived. So kind of the studies of what actually hells that happens at a biological level due to um, the consciousness. So BiTalk is a holistic approach to finding the root cause of the issue. We are more than just our uterus. 
We have stories, we have experiences, we have trauma, we have stress, we have a life, we have environments, and we're very complex beings. Another one other issue is, um, is usually more than one reason. And so we're looking with diagnosis, we're trying to find that one reason why, one reason why we have this pain. And there's probably more than one. So by talk, we look at the big picture. We look at the whole story opposed to just the symptom of what that is. And in BiTalk, we don't actually like a diagnosis. Because when we are diagnosis, we create that label, and then it's harder to get ourselves out of that label. Hi, my name is Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 20 years. Well, are you really an alcoholic, right? But people get attached to those labels. So the diagnosis, in some ways, can be harmful from our perspective. So I'm just going to really quickly summarize what BiTalk is and get more into what it means for you guys. So it's about understanding the psychology of the body and the influence it has on your health. That rather than focusing on the symptom, BiTalk looks for the hidden cause of illness by looking at the physical, emotional, and environmental factors. So we look at the whole big picture. So we look at our story and the entire context to improve our health. So we look at um, that our health challenges will arise for a variety of reasons. So we look at the whole person, the big picture, and to try to find the underlying cause and to bring things back into communication, basically the same thing over and over again. But BiTalk is a whole healthcare system. So each practitioner will work with you differently. We all have our different skill sets and our different experiences, and we can even bring in these other modalities and other training. So I bring a lot of yogic work and other energy medicine work and other experience, um, kinesiology work, even hands-on manipulation into my practices. So you may have to shop around practitioners a bit. Um, brand new practitioners are cheap and accessible but they have limitations in their training and what they may be able to do for you. You're going to pay a lot more for one of the more advanced practitioners, but they have better tools that they've learned and their experiences that they can um, probably make progress for you faster. So it's kind of win-win one way or the other that it'll take more sessions with a, a newer practitioner, but it's going to cost you less. So, um, so you might have to shop around and see who, who is the best fit for you. Um, but also drawing on Chinese medicine, we work with the meridians and uh, the Wei Qi, and we work with cellular repair, EMDR, and trauma, everything under the sun. So first thing is, is we know the body can heal itself. We cut ourselves, we scrape ourselves, it heals. Our body innately knows what to do. So that's the whole basis of body talk, is our body is amazing. It, sh it knows what it should do when it, when it breaks down. So we think of the sperm and the egg, when they connect with each other, how does that little embryo, that little cell, know it's going to be a heart or a lung? We just know. Our bodies are just that awesome. We get sick, our immune kicks in. So why is it not doing what it needs to do, is the big question. Stress, or the stories of our life, that at one point we hit a tipping point, that we're able to cope, we're able to cope, we're able to cope, last straw that broke the camel's back, right? that something shifted where our body's not able to come, um, to come back into balance again. Um, if you think about it, our heart can only give 25% of our body blood with each heartbeat. So if we're always stuck in that fight-flight response, all of our blood is going to your fight-flight muscles, to those systems that need to deal with that stress. And it's going to take that away and not give it to the systems that aren't as important. And unfortunately, our reproductive system is the first one to go usually because if we are under stress and our body isn't doing what it needs to do, taking on caring for another life is the last of its priorities. So the reproductive system is one of the first ones to suffer in those stress modes and in our body in that system. Uh, so how do we do this? The subconscious is where everything lies. If you think of an iceberg, 10% of our brain is that conscious level. Everything under the water is that unconscious. It's all of our belief systems, our memories, our knowledge. It makes up who we are. So we live or die for our beliefs. And if we get that wrong diagnosis and you're told you're going to die in a week, people go downhill really quickly. Or if you get the wrong diagnosis and say, oh, you're perfectly fine, 
often people will be. You talk about placebo effect, and a lot of ways that's what body talk tends to kind of be looking like. That if your brain and your mind and your body knows that it can heal itself, what's going to happen? Or if you think you're going to die, then you're going to be in trouble as soon as it, that mental aspect checks out. But we work with the top-down causation. In yogic philosophy, as my yoga background goes, we call this the koshas, or the five bodies, in that we have um, the physical body, we have our energy body, we have the mental body, which is our belief systems, all that mental stuff that talk therapy works on. So we know the energy body and how that affects the physical body. We know how our thoughts affect our physical body. Then we have the, men, uh, the super mental, which is our subconscious level and how we can work at that energetic level to trickle down to heal all those other levels. And that fifth level, Ananda, as mentioned previously, is bliss. And so that is our bliss body, that everything will spontaneously heal itself, that we don't have to think, we don't have to work, and that's that top-down causation. So by talk, we work at that, that second last level of the unconscious. So first step in fixing any problem is recognize that we have a problem. And once our body knows what the problem is, it can fix it. So my story, how I got to be here to you today. Well, Bree's not here anymore, <laughs> so she's, she's not with us. But the interesting thing is, is um, through my years with Body Talk, is my body responds really quickly. As soon as I recognize what the problem is, my body goes to work at repairing things. I heal and recover very quickly now. So one night last month, I guess it's been, um, I suddenly had a uterine prolapse. I am, was 12 months postpartum at the time, and my body just decided it's gonna kick my uterus out of the body and everything's bulging, all this pressure. I'm freaking out. I'm good friends with Carly Ray. She does a lot of work with me. I highly recommend seeing her. She couldn't see me for a month because <laughs> she's gonna be gone. She's like, okay, who do I need to see? Go see, uh, um, book in with, with Brie. But before I did that, I did body talk on myself that morning, 7 o'clock that morning, takes me into physically working with the relation, uh, we call it body vivaxis, of putting my uterus in relation to my diaphragm and actually physically, energetically realigning and repositioning and pairing that up with a shoulder stand, actually inverting and letting everything come back up again. And a few other different things of why my body decided to do that in the first place. Uh, I thought maybe my period was coming back. I put my diva cup in, and my body goes, uh-uh, I don't want to deal, this, deal with this, and rejected it. That was seemingly the root cause. But the fun thing was, three hours later from doing that body talk, when I went to go see Brie, everything was back in place already. <laughs> it's like I could see my IUD strings at my vaginal opening. My uterus was, like, right there. Like, it was insane. It was scary as hell. But the fun story of the fact was is Brie needed me. Her daughter needed me. Uh, she needed me to help with some other stuff. She had clients that needed me, and you guys needed me. And so as practitioners in our field, that whole uh, level of manifestation, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> so yeah, and my body. We take a little bit of beating, but I'm all good to go. I seen Carly last week, and yeah, everything's great. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so there's my story about how I got to be here. <laughs> So specifically for you guys, menstrual irregularities. So by talk, we work at reconnecting communication. So we will get our pituitary to talk to our ovaries, uh, to our adrenals, deal with that fight-flight response. And we help everybody get into communication to work at correcting what it is we need to correct. Uh, we also work with the consciousness. Our uterus is about femininity, nurturing, rejection, or acceptance. And we apply those consciousness aspects to the uterus, and as soon as it recognizes what's going on, that shift of perception will happen, and everything will actually change in that quantum mechanics of it, that our body, as soon as we consciously recognize, our body, right at the electron level, will change what it's doing. I have a really cool video on my Facebook page that explains that. But also in uh, Chinese medicine, that the liver is responsible for the movement of blood, therefore very uh, significant in our menses. So the consciousness of the liver is anger, rage, resentment, planning, organization, processing, the way chi or protection, our strength and soul, worthlessness and depression. So sometimes some of these things can trigger issues with the blood and dealing with that stuff. I often see someone will come in for a treatment for back pain and we'll spend the whole session working on their relationship and their back pain will go away. That 
we never really know what the cause is. I'm working with, through, uh, the last year I worked with three kids that were older, school-age kids wetting the bed. The root cause for, for that, for every single kid, was different. So what we do is we work with a protocol chart, structured intuition and biofeedback to get this happening. And that chart, left brain knowledge, we have that chart memorized, we work with our right brain, our intuition, which gives us that structured intuition. So here's the top part of our chart. Specifically for endometriosis, one thing that comes up quite commonly is taking us into scars and to adhesions. You guys all know that word. So I've had that come up for clients and they'll go, oh yeah, that's exactly where I had things excised before and we can work at correcting that. I have a scar on the top of my foot that would never heal properly. That was my first major healing I had in body talk was my practitioner and practice partner took me directly to that foot and you have a scar on the top of your foot? Rip my sock off? Oh yeah, I do. And it never healed properly. We had to release joy from my foot so it could heal properly. I got that scar studying yoga in Thailand and I didn't want to let go of Thailand. And so once we let go of that, that scar healed. So that was my first major physical healing thing from body talk. But um, other things, yeah, dealing with the organs, the endocrines, the Chinese elements, our environment. Eighth chakra is kind of our past life-ish stuff or hereditary stuff that we can disconnect from. That is one of my passionate areas. Uh, matrix is another really cool area, but don't have much time to go through the chart with you guys, but another area, cellular repair, really getting the body to focus on correcting and repairing. And often within that, it's a multi-step process. We have to create a whole bunch of links and create a big, big process. And biogenics is all about our emotional release. So here's Chantelle Rogers. She's a body talker in Prince Albert, so one of our local ones. So she had pain that progressively got worse. They thought she might have had endo, and they found no endo, um, but was really out of it, most like most of us, but with only two sessions she had. It resulted in her having three massive bowel movements and never had pain again. And she's now a body talker. Uh, this one is Amanda. She was one of my instructors. Um, severe pain that she'd always have to be medicated. And yeah, body talk was the remedy there. So we get lots of success stories on all different levels. My fertility clients, I have awesome stuff with getting people to ovulate again and ovulation pain and other such that I've worked with. So why I'm gonna teach you guys a tool today. It's called the cortices technique. Uh, the benefits of cortices is to take that body out of fight flight mode. So if we're always stuck in that stress, re stress response, our body isn't gonna function very well. So it improves our brain function and creates mental clarity improves the communication between our left and right hemispheres of the brain, increases the sense of relaxation and well-being, helps us to process our stress, and will help facilitate your healing in between sessions. Um, it's an underlying theory is that every relationship is reflected in the brain, that every problem we have is either a reflection in the brain or in the brain. And so we need to correct there, which is quite interesting with our people that we have next with the whole brain stuff. But um, so how the cortices technique works is pretty simple. i just maybe make that sit there. So it is creating an electromagnetic field between your hand and the brain, and we're tapping to create big spike waves of brain activity to get the two hemispheres of brain into communication. And then we tap on the heart. It's our save button. It's like knowing things by heart. It's every blood cell. Blood's about awareness going to every area of the body, telling everybody to get into communication, get out of that stress mode. So if you guys want to do this along with me, we just place a hand to the base of our skull, and we tap to the top of the head. We want to have our fingers open so we're getting both sides of the brain, and just take a deep breath in, deep breath out. One or two good breaths there, and then we tap to the heart for a breath. And then working from the base of the skull up a hand position. You don't need much overlap. And then to the heart. And then just moving from the back of the head around to the front of the head for a good breath at each point. And then a 
eventually just try to get right down to the eyebrows. So depending on your head to hand ratio, this may be four, five, six movements. And the heart, and then coming around also to the sides of the brain. So this is recommended to do daily or even more often. Um, there's the access program can teach you some very basic um, tools like this to do on your own self-healing. I recommend taking the access course if you can. And um, yes, yeah, doing this as often as you can. We have what we call the fast aid protocol. So when you're in immense pain or there's an emergency, one time to bring our mind out of that state of shock of, oh my God, I'm cut, so I'm bleeding, I gotta throw up. The second time to pull it out of that, calm it down, and then if, or to focus on the healing, then the third time to bring it back away and to calm everything down again. So. How can I learn more? So bytalksystem.com is the Bytalk corporate website. My website, fisherfamilybytalk.com. I have my Facebook page, which is slash JYYoga. Um, right now, Fisher Family Bytalk just reverts to jyyoga.ca, so both websites get you there. Um, the Science and Philosophy of Bytalk book I have with me, if anyone wants to borrow it, it's a really good way to explain things. Um, finding a local practitioner. Uh, there's me, there's lots. Um, Katie Bell, Sharon Koenig, and Susan Lee all donated gift certificates for the door prizes. So there's four of us here that you guys may already be in contact with. But one of the best ways is to actually take your Bytalk training. There's a course next weekend, if anybody wants to dive right in. I actually took my Bytalk training only of ever having one session in my life. So, but, um, so next weekend, June 24th, tw 21st to 24th, there is a three-day intro to body talk course, um, the fundamentals course with Alison Bachmeyer. Alison was a third-year med student when she got cancer and found her way into body talk, dropped out of med school, and she's now a body talk teacher. She's amazing, so she's a great one to learn with, even from the medical end of things, because she was a med student when she came in. Any questions? Actually, on that note, with the course, one of the best things and why I heal so fast is I can treat myself, but also I trade and swap sessions. So for you get so much healing going through every single part of that protocol chart when you're taking the course that you get so much immense healing from the training itself, getting practice on, and but then you can trade sessions. So it's the most cost-effective way. So if there's a couple of you guys get it, then you guys can trade sessions and get treated. Treating myself has limitations because my brain thinks I know what the problem is. And same thing with treating my kids. I usually have to get other people to treat my kids for the best results too. So yeah, that's the, the best, most cost-effective way and then even make some money too. So any questions? My talk is weird. It's one of those things you just need to experience to understand. Yes? I just had a comment Ah, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Dealing with the depression, the grief, the fears, the phobias, any of the stress that you have. Body talk works on all those levels. It's just awesome that way. Any other questions or comments? No, thank you guys.
And uh, just talking on that too, um, Joanne has some discount coupons over here that we have here and at the uh, front table if anybody didn't know that. Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you for having us. My name is Ali Jacoby. This is Patrick Hill. We are both an Opinel Method Neuro Movement practitioners, which is what we're going to be talking to you about today. Um, I'm also a speech language pathologist here at RUH. And um, I recently um, finished my training over the last couple of years, and me and Patrick both have very different stories about what got us into wanting to take the training through the Nottbanyal method, neuro movement. Um, my story is because of my son. He was born um, with a brain injury, a lack of oxygen and blood flow in utero, and as a result has cerebral palsy. Um, when, we were, when he was about a year and a half, we found out about neuro movement, started doing it with the local practitioner here in the city, Dan Olette, and he immediately started making significant gains, significant progress and he does so much more than we were ever told he would do. Um, and Patrick, you'll hear about his story, quite different. His um, has more to do with per a personal story about his pain and um, overcoming years of chronic pain, which a lot of you will be able to relate more to him that way. So, what is neural movement? I'm gonna talk to you guys about what, you know, We'll make sure this looks okay for you guys. I'm going to talk to you about what neuro movement is. I'm going to walk you guys through a mini transformational movement lesson. And then I'm going to talk to you about the nine essentials. So I'm going to give you a little overview of what this is. And then Patrick will talk about his experience with it and how neuro movement can help with pain relief, not just pain management. So Neuro movement was developed by Anat Benyel. She has been doing this work for almost 40 years. She learned from Moshe Feldenkrais, who is the who invented the Feldenkrais method. And learning from him, she has developed her method and it has evolved into the Anat Benyel method, neuro movement. Um, it works on the same principles as neuroplasticity and rewiring the brain through movement and the use of the nine essentials. Um, Anod has recently said that she's so excited that the field of medicine is so interested and involved in neuroplasticity and right now because finally after all of these years the evidence and the research is catching up to what she's been doing for, for almost 40 years. So, neuromovement focuses on providing the brain with new information to overcome pain and limitations by the use of movement and the nine essentials. So, what is the job of the brain? The brain is an information system. Its job is to put order in the disorder, make sense out of the nonsense, and it essentially, it drives our whole body. It's in charge of everything that we do, everything that we feel, and everything that we make sense of. So, Sorry about this, guys. How do we get information, new information into the brain? And a lot of people think that it is through stimulation. And it is true that we need stimulation to get information into the brain, but not stimulation alone. So stimulation in and of itself is not new information. And there was a study done by Mosley and colleagues in 2008 that, that talked about how if you only stimulate, there's not going to be any change. So what they did was they took two groups of people who both had complex regional pain syndrome, which affected their limbs, which can be extremely debilitating. Patrick's going to talk about it. And what they did was they hid their arm behind a screen, and the first group was told to pay attention to what they were feeling, and they were either touched with a cork of a wine bottle or the tip of a pen lid. And 
to make note of what they were feeling, where they were touched, how it felt. The other group, their arm was put behind the screen. They were told just to, they were told not to do anything, not to pay attention to anything, just that they were going to be touched, but they didn't need to, to pay attention. And what they noticed after that study, what was found was the people that were told to pay attention to what they were feeling had a significant decrease in their pain and a significant increase in their level of functioning. And the people that weren't told to pay attention to what they were feeling had no change in their level of pain and no change in their level of functioning. So that study just goes to show that if a difference isn't perceived in the brain, then it doesn't exist. And there is no new information that way. So through neuromovement, the goal is to provide the person and provide the brain with the conditions that can make positive change. And we do this through the use of the nine essentials. So when you're experiencing pain, especially very intense pain, which many of you experience, it's very, very hard to perceive a difference because that's all encompassing and that's all the brain can focus on. So our goal would be to find a way where we can lower that threshold and bring you to a place where you are able to perceive the differences and create a learning brain and be able to start, start learning and start perceiving pain in a different way. So it's the perception of differences that leads to differentiation and the creation of new connections, which is what will open up the pattern, open up um, the opportunity for integration of new patterns. So what I'm going to show you next, I would like you to just shout out what you see on the screen there. It can be anything. Okay. Limp. Dog. Next one, what do you guys see? Okay, and great answers, they're all good. Next, next picture. A duck, cool, okay, and the next one. Perfect. So we'll go to the next one that shows all four. So, as you can see, as we add more pieces, we get a duck. So this is showing the process of differentiation. As you get more pieces, you're adding differentiation. If you think about this duck made up of, let's say, millions and millions and millions of tiny little grains of sand, the infinite number of possibilities, this duck could turn into a house, you could, you could shape it into anything. Even that duck has a lot of pieces you could make different things out of. The first duck, there's not a lot of options there. So if you think of this in relation to your pain, think of this, that fourth duck as a pain-free person and the number of possibilities that person has. And as pain develops and, and keeps debilitating a person, you're losing differentiation. And as soon as the brain recognizes or feels pain, it immediately starts retracting connections. It wants to protect, protect, protect. And you, so less pieces, less pieces, less pieces. So the goal in this modality is to increase the number of pieces you have, the number of options you have. If you think about the way you were able to do something before, the way the freedom you had in walking, dancing, moving, and through pain with endometriosis, how much more limiting certain things can be. Because it, as it was talked about before, it's, it doesn't just affect one area. It starts, you know, you can start to feel it in your limbs, in the way you walk, in your breathing. And, you know, the brain, it's the, our body and our brain, it's all one system. So, anyway, our duck. So even adding, you know, two or three more pieces can give you so many more, so much more freedom and so many more possibilities. So we do this through the use of the nine essentials, and Not Benyel, uh, after years and years of working, finally wrote a, wrote a couple books and named these. And these are the same principles 
that support neuroplasticity in, in the uh, neuroscience research. And she has put them into practical terms and it, been able to use them on people and, and been able to make significant changes, not only with pain, but like I said with my son, cerebral palsy, autism, ADHD, genetic disorders, stroke, brain injury, Parkinson's. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding, well, how can one method cover so many different areas, such a wide variety of ages, from infant to elderly, from you know brain injury, stroke, just even stress and anxiety. It's because the brain doesn't discriminate titles or diagnoses, like it was talked about before. Um, the brain just takes in information and does with it what it wants. So, nine essentials. I'm only going to talk about a couple of them for time's sake. So anyway, movement with attention, slow, variation, subtlety, enthusiasm, flexible goals, the learning switch, imagination, and dreams, and awareness. Those are her nine. And I'll just talk about a couple. So before uh, we get into that, I'm just going to ask you guys to get up. We're going to do a mini TML, which is a transformational movement lesson, which when we don't do the hands-on work with people, the TMLs are another form that this work takes place. So it's being instructed through a movement and, and this is typically done, we do it in classes or you can do it in DVDs at home. So my lovely assistant Patrick is going to be doing the movements with you guys if you have any, if you're wondering what does she mean by that, just look at Patrick. All right, you're going to be, you might have to, we're going to be reaching down towards our toes, you might have to make, turn at a 45 degree angle, just give yourself a little space. So stand up. Uh, with your feet spread comfortably and gently bend down and let your hands move towards your feet but without stretching or forcing. Go slow, notice how you feel as you move, pay attention and just notice where you go without any force and then come back up to standing. And again just stand with your feet spread comfortably, bend your knees a little, put your right hand just above your right knee on your thigh and then put your left hand just above your left knee. Then lean on your legs with the weight of your upper body resting on your hands. Begin to round your back and at the same time pull your belly in and look down at your belly. Then gently arch your back, push your belly out, lift your head and look up. And go back and forth like this about three or four times. Come back to standing when you're done that. And simply bend forward slowly and just take your hands down towards your feet and just notice is there some difference or change already. And come back up and stand with your feet spread, your knees bent a little, and this time lean with both hands on your left leg, just above the knee as before. Very gently and slowly round your back and look down, and then arch your back, free the belly muscles, push them out and look up. Go back and forth four or five times. And then after that stand and just rest for a moment and feel how you stand. Again, stand with your knees bent a little bit, feet spread, and at this time with both hands lean on your right knee. Very gently and slowly round your back and look down, and then come and arch your back, free your belly muscles, push the belly out, and look up. Do this again about four times. When you're done that, stand with your feet spread comfortably and simply bend down and feel if you can bend more easily and farther than before. Are your toes closer to your hands? Yeah. Everyone's going to have different, different <laughs> results, it's fine. There's no right or wrong, it's okay if, it, if there's no difference. Uh, but with the variations provided, your brain got information to figure out how to do something differently. So it, it wasn't about doing it over and over and stretching and trying harder. It was about providing the brain with variations. 
in order to get a desired outcome. So the first essential that a knot has described is called movement with attention. So it's attention to what you feel as you move. Um, again, when you're in excruciating pain, this isn't the time to be trying to make a change or trying to let the brain learn. The brain is busy with pain and it's very, very hard for the brain to learn during, when you're in pain. But there are going to be windows outside of that where we can work together and then, and then you're able to pay attention to the movement without, without pain. And that's when we would want to work together. And there's just, after this, there's just some research that backs up um, movement with attention from the um, neuroplasticity research. Number two essential is slow. Fast, you can only do what you already know. So if you think about learning to drive, learning to play piano, learning to knit, anything that you're learning for the first time has to be done slowly uh, if you want to be effective and, and learn how to do it well. Uh, again, more uh, research supporting slow. Variation, oh, did I miss one? Subtlety, subtlety. Yeah, subtlety. Is the reduction of effort, force, and intensity um, when we do things with less force, we're able to feel more. So you're able to perceive differences much more than if you go fast and hard. So reduction of effort. Variation number four is in our work, the intentional variation of differences. All of our mistakes and approximations are part of the process to lead to a desired outcome. So again, if you think back to the, think back to the duck, um, think about how much variation you may have lost with your pain. Um, maybe you're only able to do something one way now, whereas before you had many options or many ways to lead to a certain outcome or to do something. And as you lose differentiation, you lose options. Some research about variation. And the last one that I'm going to talk about is imagination and dreams. These actually guide your brain to continue growing and developing. Um, imagining a movement can actually be more powerful than actually executing the movement itself. And there's a lot of imagining done in this work, especially when, when there's any pain involved. If there's any kind of injury where someone can't move a certain part, uh, they're told to imagine it. There's been research that show, using uh, functional MRIs that shows the part of the brain that lights up when people are asked to do a certain movement. And that same part of the brain lights up when they're asked to imagine the movement. So the brain recognizes it the same, whether it's actually being done or imagined. And imagining the movement can be very powerful. I mean, it's been done for a long time in sports. Um, Anat actually did this with her father. I think he was in his 80s at the time. He broke his leg. He was in a full leg cast. And she did her work with him strictly using imagination. And after his cast came off, he had zero muscle atrophy. And he was in his 80s. And you, it's just expected. Like, you take a cast off, there's atrophy. He imagined, he did all of the movement lessons with her, imagining using the left leg. I think it was the left. Doesn't matter what leg it was. But he imagined it, and it was the exact same size as the other leg. It's, it was unbelievable. Okay, so with that, I am going to pass it over to Patrick um, to talk about his experience with, it, with neuromovement and talk a little bit about pain and, and endometriosis. Great, thank you, Ali. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Hill and uh, my part of our presentation is going to focus on how neuromovement can create positive conditions for pain relief and not just control pain. I'll do this by giving uh, my experience with 
neuro movement and how it changed my life, and also touch on the brain's perception of pain. So I've had ingrown toenail issues since I was born. Like my mom said, I came out and my I was my toenails my my big toes were infected from the from the uh, toenails being ingrown. This has meant I've had multiple surgeries over the years to have the toenails either the ingrown part taken out and then I've had both big toenails fully removed. When I was 20, one of the surgeries changed my life. I contracted a neuropathic condition called complex regional pain syndrome. This neuropathic condition affects one in 100,000 people and is caused from any type of soft tissue damage. So a cut, a bruise, a broken bone, or a sprain, or in my case, surgery. It affects the limbs, either the arms or the legs. The uh, CRPS, or complex, there's short for complex regional pain syndrome, makes the sympathetic nervous system very sensitive. And the sympathetic nervous system controls first touch, blood flow, temperature and is the alarm system of the body so you can you can kind of see that since it's the alarm system and who here has felt fear and anxiety and stress when you have a flare-up with your endometriosis so then that system is starts starts to flare up some more because stress brings on pain pain brings on stress and just keeps on snowballing and getting more and more intense. Other symptoms that arose, or I guess I've had um, blood flow issues. And the, the nerve damage actually, it started with in my left big toe and it moved through my left leg, consuming the whole left leg and then migrating over and uh, consuming three quarters of my right, so from my mid thigh down to my foot. There's been blood flow issues uh, from the feeling of having razor blades being pumped through my veins with every heartbeat in my legs to uh, having swelling where my lower leg starts to swell up like a balloon. Other symptoms that arose are eczema, severe eczema on the bottom of my feet. Um, I also have leg spasms as well. They range from a myclonic twitch to full out bone crushing spasms where my legs are going as hard and as fast as they can, uh, throwing my whole body into spasm. These severe spasms would last from two to 15 minutes. And yeah, it, they happen quite regularly too. It's just, that was just my body's way of of taking in information and they didn't know what to do with it. So that's how the the release mechanism for just the sensory information that wasn't sure what, had, what to do with. When I began the neuro movement practitioner's training, my pain symptoms were presented as burning, stabbing, or crushing feelings in my legs and escalated to the feeling that my legs were being peeled like a banana at during severe flare-ups, um, and there were also or there were multiple sensations at the same time. Even getting close to people hurt. When I'd be within four to five feet of a person, my nervous system would start to wind up, anticipating the pain of being touched. I don't know if any of you have felt that. Yeah. Yeah, I see a lot of nods. Yeah, that's it's very hard to be out in public when you have that that anxiety level. In 2011, my therapy regime started to not be as effective as it was before, and I needed a change. I learned about neuro movement and started getting private lessons, and also joined the transformational movement lesson classes. With the relief and with the changes that 
I experienced, I decided to take the practitioner's training in 2013. This was a huge undertaking because it's only offered in San Francisco, <laughs> which <laughs> it was a lot. So at the beginning of the training, I was fighting the fear, anxiety, and chronic pain of traveling to San Francisco, being in a room about the same size as this with a hundred other people. I had back surgery eight months before this, before the training started to fix a pain control device that's attached to my spine. And I was afraid to move from my chest down, so pretty much from, from here down, I was afraid to move. When my classmates would work with me in the first few segments of the training, they would always comment, it's like you have two bodies. One body, or your upper body is normal, and your lower body is not connected. And that was true. I learned to control my pain through clinical hypnosis and disconnecting the two halves of my body so that I could get some relief. Through the process of differentiation, given by the hands-on and the movement lessons that we did th during the trainings, that connection changed. I was remapping the parts that were taken away from years of chronic pain and I was becoming whole again. I was more comfortable around my classmates. Traveling was a lot easier. I was able to walk barefoot and stand on my tiptoes for the first time in 15 years. Even being close to people, I, I didn't have the fear of being touched, which was huge. And I was also becoming more socially active because of that. Neuro movement also made the other treatments that I was doing more potent. I was getting more out of them because I, my brain and nervous system were perceiving the differences and just functioning at a higher level. I'm averaging one leg spasm a year instead of daily. I, the vascular sensitivity, swelling, and um, and eczema have been gone for about three years. I've dropped my, I've lowered my medication 500 milligrams a day. I. Uh, It's, yeah, it's just, it's been amazing the, the changes that have happened over three years and, and, or over, I guess, five years, but I've had this condition since 1999, so it's been a long time. And aside from being an ABM practitioner, I also run a small contracting business for construction, and it's doing very well. Whereas before the training, I was working, I could barely work four days a week at a sedentary job. So what do, C or what do endometriosis and CRPS have in common? The common thread is a process called central sensitization. Has anybody heard of that before? Yeah, yeah, a couple knots, perfect. So this is a condition associated with the development and maintenance of chronic pain. It happens when the central nervous system goes through a process called winding up. Who's heard of, has anybody heard of winding up? Yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Winding up happens when the nerves sending pain signals to the brain fire more frequently and at a greater intensity. This will create a habitual pattern in the central nervous system that will make um, that pain signal continually fire without any new stimulus coming in. So the area may be healed, but it still will be painful. And that's even after surgeries. Central sensitization plays a major role in a lot of cr chronic pain disorders, including endometriosis. Uh, oh, 
awesome. This is, and central sensitization is mediated by the brain and central nervous system. And this is where neural movement comes in. Since neural movement speaks to the brain and central nervous system and allows it to put the order in the disorder. The, so what the brain's job is to make sense of the sensory information that is given to us both internally and externally. It acts as an information system and learns our experiences. And chronic pain is an experience that keeps us in a survival mode. This is a lower level of brain function. This protective mode is very valuable. It keeps us safe in, uh, in dangerous situations, allows us to get out of dangerous situations. But when we're in that constant fight or flight state, it makes it hard to learn, live, and progress. And as you can see, Homer's brain with the survival brain is a lot smaller and less available than Homer's learning brain. And that's where neuro movement is. With, with neuro, neuro movement, we, cre or we look to create the conditions for that person's brain to enter a space where it's safe to learn. When we're not in that protective mode, we're more open to learning and growth. Neuro movement is so effective because it gets us and keeps us in that learning mode by giving us experiences that are safe and within our abilities. So one way our brain perceives pain is a process called smudging. Has anyone heard of smudging? Yeah, a few? Okay. We all have a map of our brain in our body, our, our virtual body or the homunculus as it's called. And as you can see, this is how our body looks in our brain. It's disproportionate because the more we use an area, the larger it becomes. That's why the hands, the tongue, and the lips are so large compared to the rest of the body because we need more space, more information to do the refined functions of writing, speaking, eating. Whereas to the rest of the body, there's still differentiation there, but not to the, the same degree. When an area of our body is in trouble, the, the brain cells looking after that area call upon neighboring cells to help out. These cells that help out are called disinhibited and attach themselves to the, the area that's in trouble. This is a very effective approach to short-lived pain, but after a while, the cells that these disinhibited cells reduce the clearly defined outline of our virtual body, of the affected area. And you can see, uh, can I just have the laser pointer? Thanks. You can see this hand here is very, you can see every single finger. And then on the, the right hand side, you can see that there's might have been some an injury or something to the outside of the hand and the only clearly defined finger is the index finger the other three in the brain's perception are just one complete unit and this can happen anywhere in the body it's so with endometriosis it could be that the the ribs, the diaphragm, everything is starting to become one block with the pelvis. It, there's no differentiation between the 12 or 24 ribs and the the spinal column and, and pelvis. It's just one complete thing. The areas of the body might feel like they're not part of your body anymore or the size might be affected as well might be, feel larger or smaller. 
the more chronic the pain, the more smudging occurs in the brain. The more difficult that body will, or the area of the body will be to use, or the more sensitivity you'll have in that area. The physical body mirrors the state of our virtual representation of our body, or of the virtual image, or the homunculus. So that simply means that if there's a change in how our brain perceives our body, that is going to be reflected on the physical or physically as well. So if we lose an area from stroke or some sort of injury, then that side stops working. So if you're if you have a, a stroke on the the right side of your brain, the left side of your body start or stops to function or has reduced function. All right. So what can we do to reduce chronic smudging? According to leading researchers, there are three main ways to reduce chronic smudging. First is education. We need to take away the fear around chronic pain. When we understand what pain is and our relationship with pain, we allow ourselves the ability to increase our physical capacity, reduce pain, and improve our quality of life. The four main essentials that apply the, to this are slow movement with attention, learning switch, and variation. All the essentials apply to the three ways to reduce chronic smudging. I'm just going through the top four just for time's sake. Next is graded exposure. Having a graded, graded level of activity from imagining movement to actual movement. Every time you move in a pain-free, controlled way, it reinforces the recreation of that smudged area. And as Ali said before, the brain still functions the same when you imagine movement to when you physically move. And the four main essentials for that are imagination and dreams, variation, slow, and movement with attention. Finally, we have taking the area out of context, which is simply exploring with that area in space. Even though there's a lot of pelvic pain with endometriosis, there's still ways that to explore with the pelvis in space safely and within your abilities. And the four main essentials for the, for the taking the area to context are variation, flexible goals, slow, and movement with attention. So in conclusion, neural movement is designed to create conditions for our nervous system to move towards a learning mode. We can apply the essentials Ali discussed earlier to provide opportunities to move in a pain-free, safe way. Even with the chronic pain that you experience now, there's still an opportunity for change. When we change the trajectory of any movement, either physical or mental, this will alter the outcomes that we commonly achieve. With the reduced demand of trying to achieve an objective that's currently out of reach, neural movement keeps us in the moment giving us a time and space to move within our means, working slowly from where we are and achieving a higher quality of life. So with that, the, you can access neural movement for, through, with, with our local practitioners, either Ali, myself, there's also, there's three others and then soon to be four. There's also, so either private lessons, there's group classes that you can attend, intensives which instead of seeing one practitioner in a week of 10 lessons over five days, you work with the group so you're, you're seeing multiple practitioners throughout that week, just another level of variation. And then there's also DVDs and online streaming that you can do so you can do movement lessons at home so that 
if you do have a flare up and you can take care of yourself before you even see a practitioner. So for more information, you can go to our website, bimt.ca. And there's a lot of great resources that are available on the website. And I'd like to thank you for inviting us to speak at your conference. And what, do we have time for questions? And any questions? It is, it's definitely just like body talk. It's something you need to experience. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely, it's amazing. And even Move Into Life is an amazing book. If you have a chance to... Like the name, the novel, yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's called Move Into Life by Anat Banyal. Banyal spelt like Daniel, but with a B. Um, and she also wrote a book called Kids Beyond Limits that talks more about children with special needs. Um, so yeah. Those are her two books. And um, yeah, like Patrick said, again, it, it's, it's very abstract. It's, it's counter, a lot of it is counterintuitive. You hear it, you're like, what? That doesn't make sense. And you do have to experience it to kind of understand it. You know, with my son, we were doing lessons with him for over a year before I got my first movement lesson. And I just thought, I, I would just watch what Dan would do with him, and it looked like magic. I'm like, you're barely doing anything, and he's changing. And uh, and then once I started feeling it myself and getting lessons myself, I I got it more. But anyway, we're gonna wrap up and let the next person go. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks, guys. And yeah, there is business cards for them here as well as some pamphlets. So any of the information that you uh, maybe want to check on again, you can access stuff through their website and their contact information as well. Um, so thank you guys very much. I realized that we had actually, I didn't uh, introduce you, so I'm not a very great hostess yet. So we'll do a couple more door prizes here. We're getting set up for the next one.
Okay, we are going to get started in just one second here. We're just going to do a draw for the raffle. So the raffle, um, because it is something that people are paying money into, if they are not here, we're still going to be posting the tickets online. Uh, so just so you guys know what's going on. So for people who didn't see it, this is an almost $500 basket full of wonderful, amazing goodies. So it's a big deal. Good luck, everyone. Oh, thanks. Give me some Spanish blood. 747-837. Uh, Anybody here? Maybe? Without any further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Susan Tupper. Please help me welcome her to talk about uh, exercise therapy and chronic pain. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the mic's working. Good. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Laura, for inviting me to come and present today. And uh, so I think bonus points to everyone who is still here at the end of a very long and informative day. So I don't know what those bonus points will do for you, but... You know, at least you get breaking rates. Um, so yeah, my name is Susan Tupper. I'm a physiotherapist and I have a PhD in community health and epidemiology. And my job right now is working with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, um, basically making recommendations of uh, what can be done to improve pain. And trust me, I have been advocating since I started this job for the last four and a half years uh, for more services for people with chronic pain. Um, I feel like there's more audience for that, but uh, that would have been a whole talk in and of itself. But today I'm going to be focusing on exercise. <clears throat> I'm going to start off talking a little bit about how pain works, and you've heard a little bit about that today, uh, different types of pain and how uh, endometriosis might contribute, the different ways that that may contribute and, and uh, turn into chronic pelvic pain. Um, and then I'm going to talk specifically about what impacts exercise has on the nervous system as well as on uh, the immune system in the body and how that might influence pain as well. Um, and then thirdly, um, all of you know very well that exercise is not just go out and do it because it's awesome and fun and feels really good. Um, it's, a, it's hard and it's painful for people who live with chronic pain. And so what are some strategies that you might use to uh, basically to make exercise more comfortable? <clears throat> All right, so starting off talking about the nervous system here. I'm looking at the wrong screen here. Abracadabra, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about the nervous system. I know you've, you've uh, seen this before, but I know too that repetition is the key to learning. So um, you'll uh, remember it very succinctly after this presentation. Um, so the reason why I like to talk about this um, pretty much in every pain presentation that I give, I talk about how the nervous system works because there are a lot of misconceptions about how pain works. We tend to, as individuals, um, as well as healthcare providers, tend to think of pain as a symptom of underlying tissue pathology. And, uh, and so there's this assumption that if somebody has a lot of pain, there must be a lot of tissue pathology to explain that. And then, of course, you go through investigations. Nothing can be found to explain it. You're told there's nothing wrong with you. Um, I don't know what's causing your pain. Maybe you, you know, you're, you're just really stressed out or something, or um, people tend to minimize your experience. Um, the reality of how pain works, though, is so much more fascinating than just pain as a symptom. It is a symptom, but it's also it can become a chronic disease in its own right because of changes in the nervous system that have been mentioned a bit today. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, start off talking a little bit about kind of the healthy nervous system and then how that can change for people with chronic pain. And this does not want to work for me today. Okay, so this is a very basic schematic of a nervous system. So you've got the brain up at the top here. It's facing towards the left side of the screen. Underneath the brain is the brain stem, very important area. 
Um, underneath that is the spinal cord, and then branching out from and running into the central nervous system are a network, is a very complex network of various different types of nerves that carry information to or from the body tissues to the central nervous system. <clears throat> So one of these networks of nerves are called nociceptors. So nociceptors are important because they carry information specifically about danger to our body tissues, not tissue damage, danger to the tissues. And normally these nerves are what we call high threshold nerves. So they require a lot of stimulus to make them active. <clears throat> the interesting thing about um, any nerve really in the threshold for firing for a nerve is that those thresholds can change within a second from various contexts that we're living in, from the thoughts that we think of, to um, the chemicals that are in our body tissues, those thresholds can vary. Um, but for the most part, these nerves are high thresholds, so it requires a lot to make them fire. And they fire with uh, mechanical pressure, so a lesion in the tissues that's pushing on muscles or viscera or nerves, um, inflammation or chemical stimuli, <clears throat> and thermal stimuli, so too hot or too cold, will activate these nerves. And when they're activated, abracadabra, there we go. <clears throat> when they're activated, when the threshold is reached, that nerve fires, and the stimulus travels along that nerve, a single nerve from whatever part of the body, up to the central nervous system, to the spinal cord. And at that point, the peripheral nerve communicates with a set of nerves in the spinal cord, and then run up to the brainstem. <clears throat> when I say a, one nerve communicates with another one, what I mean is that the end of one nerve will release a number of neurotransmitters, little tiny little chemicals that float across that gap, bind to receptors on the next nerve, and then cause actions in the next nerve. Some of those neurotransmitters are excitatory, so they make it more likely that the next nerve will fire. Others are inhibitory, so they make it less likely that the next nerve will fire. So the types of neurotransmitters, the receptors that receive those neurotransmitters, as well as a number of other complex things that I'm not gonna get into today, can have an influence on what's happening in the central nervous system. <clears throat> so the amount of nociception in those peripheral nerves is proportionate to the amount of tissue danger or tissue damage that you're experiencing. But once it hits the central nervous system, it's under a whole bunch of other influences. And we know now that not just the brain is an important area of modulation of our symptoms, but even the spinal cord. There's a lot of modulation that happens at the spinal cord from other peripheral information coming in, like proprioceptive information showing where our body is in space, to light touch information on mechanoreceptors, other sensory information coming in that converges in that same area can modify the amount of nociception and whether or not it continues and travels along the central nerve, up the spinal cord through the central nervous system. <clears throat> so lots of modulation. Then of course, if the conditions are right, the stimulus travels up the spinal cord, up to the brainstem, another area of tremendous modulation because this is where it's kind of that juncture between the brain and numerous parts of the brain are sending information to the brain stem and influencing again the central nervous system saying, yes, I want more of that information, so it's amplifying, or it's saying, I want less of that information. Don't tell me about that now. Shuts it right down. So there's lots of uh, situations, lots of examples that have been shared of uh, situations where people can have gross tissue damage, incredible amounts of, of disease or injury, and they feel no pain from it. In fact, about a third of people that come into the emergency department say they don't feel any pain at the time of their injury. It can be a traumatic amputation of a limb, or they can have something sticking out of their tissues, or gross tissue disease and not feel any pain from it because of the influence on the, of the central nervous system on what's happening with this nociception. <clears throat> so if the conditions are right, of course, the information goes from the brain stem up to about 20 different areas of the brain that all talk to each other and determine a whole bunch of information about uh, the stimulus, whether or not we perceive it as pain, whether it will feel like sharp, achy, or dull, throbby, or where on the body we'll feel it, as well as what emotional response or behavioral response we'll have. So it's quite a complex process that changes 
whether we perceive something as nociception to whether we perceive it as pain. So just a reminder, those thresholds change in the periphery as well as in the central nervous system, and nociception is proportionate to the amount of tissue damage, but pain is an experience. It's not nociception, it's not tissue damage, it's what the brain decides it's going to do with all of the information, including nociception. <clears throat> to make things a little more complex, there are also different types of pain. There are three basic categories of pain. So nociceptive pain is what we call the good pain. It's basically pain that tells us um, that there's, you, you've got a paper cut on your hand, you look down, you see the paper cut, you can um, use that information to escape from harm. Um, not a paper cut, that's not really a threatening situation, but if you've damaged your tissues and you get that, that pain, you can escape from harm, you can seek recovery and relief. Uh, the two other types of pain here, neuropathic pain and pain amplification are more related to what's happening in the nerves. So neuropathic pain is related to pain that arises from an injury, an identifiable injury or disease in a nerve. So either in the peripheral nervous system, so shingles is an example, a pinched nerve in the back or in the wrist, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, those are examples of neuropathic pains. In the central nervous system, diseases like, well, a stroke can cause uh, central pain, spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, MS, lots of central neuropathic injuries or diseases that can cause neuropathic pain. And neuropathic pain has more of that classic kind of electric shock type of quality to it. Pain amplification syndrome, other people have mentioned that today. The new term for it is nociplastic pain or central sensitization is another word that's commonly used to describe that pain. So you can actually get pain amplification in the peripheral nervous system, but quite often it becomes problematic when it um, occurs in the central nervous system and stays. So it's, it's okay to have uh, central amplification of symptoms, that's a normal function of our nervous system, but when it stays around and it lasts and persists beyond the time when it's useful, that's when it becomes um, abnormal and no longer useful. And again, things get more complicated because no one has one type of pain. You can have one type of pain, but for the most part, the more chronic pain is, the more you get these overlapping pain types. And that's certainly true of people with chronic pelvic pain related to endometriosis. You can have lesions in there, you can have increased inflammation, um, and so a, a couple of different types of nociceptive pain, but you can have injury to nerves in around those lesions, and you can also have the central sensitization that makes things quite complex. Um, and and sometimes not related to your tissue pathology. So somebody with endometriosis can have a surgery to remove the causes of their nociceptive pain, but they still have the neuropathic or the pain amplification, and so the pain can continue for some people after surgery, unfortunately. All right, <clears throat> so let's take a bit of a shift and look at what happens in the nervous system in the body when we exercise. So, under normal healthy nervous system conditions, when we exercise, we get a brief period of reduced pain sensitivity. So the fancy term, everybody needs to have a fancy term for something that's going on in the body. So this is called exercise-induced hypoalgesia. So hypo meaning less, algesia meaning pain. So a brief period of reduced sensitivity to pain when we exercise. And it seems to occur regardless of the type of exercise. So there have been research protocols where they've had people hold um, basically a grip strength um, exercise for 25% of their maximum contraction for three minutes, and that will induce an exercise hypoalgesia. You get more of a response with aerobic type of exercises than you do with resistance, but you get it with both. And for some people, it lasts for several minutes after they exercise. For others, it's a, a few hours after they exercise. There is a bit of a dose response with this, so the more intensely you exercise, the more of this EIH response you get, or the more sen uh, reduced sensitivity to pain that you get. In adults who don't live with chronic pain, a dozen studies were, were pooled together in a meta-analysis, and they found that overall, for people who don't live with chronic pain, it's about a 40% increase in thresholds, um, so you require more stimulus to cause the same amount of pain. Uh, for people with chronic pain, though, they, they still overall do get a reduction in their pain sensitivity, so it requires about 20% more stimulus uh, with exercise to cause the same level of pain. 
So they still get that EIH response. It's just not as robust as it is for people who don't live with chronic pain. So let's take a look at what is causing this response. So somebody earlier today mentioned endorphins. When we exercise, our body produces its own opioids. <clears throat> In fact, the only reason why the medications you take for pain, the reason why they work is because they mimic what your body is producing. So our body with exercise produces endogenous opioids, endogenous meaning from within. So it produces its own uh, opioids. Our body also produces its own cannabis, <laughs> so endocannabinoids. Um, and of course, I've got the plant-based varieties of uh, poppies and, and cannabis up here, but of course, it's, it's produced by our bodies. Uh, we also get a net reduction in systemic inflammation when we exercise. So our contracting skeletal muscles produce this uh, molecule called interleukin-6, and that's actually a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's something that that is considered an inflammation marker. And when we exercise, that's produced by our muscles. But that one kickstarts the whole anti-inflammatory cascade. So increased IL-6, interleukin-6, will set up this whole process where our body reduces the amount of inflammation that's in it throughout our bodies for about two days after you exercise. Um, so a nice anti-inflammatory response with exercise. There are also dozens of different neurotransmitter changes. Remember, the neurotransmitters are the little molecules that allow communication from one nerve to the next, and neurotrophin changes, uh, different proteins that affect how the nerves function. So things like increased brain serotonin, and serotonin, if you remember, or at least serotonin produced in the brain is kind of a happy drug. It, makes, uh, it improves your mood, makes you feel better. Other things like uh, GABA, so this one is actually in the spinal cord. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it calms down the activity of the nervous system. And then other things that are responsible for, basically for recovery and regeneration of nerves in the peripheral or central nervous system. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor are produced when we exercise. We get an increase in those. So that's wonderful for people who don't live with chronic pain, but unfortunately on a sensitized nervous system, some of these things can exacerbate pain and they may not work quite as well for people with chronic pain. So people with chronic pain do not produce as robust a response of endorphins when they exercise. They don't produce as much endocannabinoids. They still get some, but not quite the same amount as people who don't live with chronic pain. And other things as well, so for example, GABA in a healthy nervous system is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, but in people with chronic pain and central sensitization is actually an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it kind of has a negative role for people who have central sensitization. Same thing with brain drive neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor. Both of those will help the nerves regenerate and recover, but unfortunately over the short term when you exercise, they make things more sensitive. So does that mean that people with central sensitization and chronic pain should not exercise? Nope. <laughs> um, it'd be a weird talk if that was my, <laughs> my, uh, my conclusion, but no. Um, actually, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, randomized control trials, dozens of meta-analyses that show that when people with all types of chronic pain, nociceptive, neuropathic, central sensitization, and the combined versions of those, all types of pain respond positively to exercise for the majority of people, not necessarily one individual, but the majority of people. And I've bolded the studies that are specific to uh, chronic pain uh, related to endometriosis. So there are a few, not very much research in that area, but there are a few showing that exercise is beneficial for, for the population uh, that we're discussing today. And so you, you do get reductions in pain with exercise, but a number of other impacts as well. So if you think back to that slide that I showed all of the impacts of exercise on pain and why we get that EIH response, if you change that and talked about what medications do for pain, typically we prescribe things like opioids or cannabis is now um, on the grow for, for recommendations for chronic pain. We prescribe things like tricyclic antidepressants and gabapentinoids um, and uh, other, other uh, um, 
antidepressants, those kinds of things that impact all of the things that I talked about. So if you were to create one little handful of pills to give for somebody with pain, you might put all of those different medications in there, but you get that with one dose of exercise. And then over the long term, um, of course, you get all of these changes that you might also expect with that kind of polypharmaceutical cocktail that, that you get with exercise. So over the long term, over the short term, exercise may sensitize the nervous system for somebody with chronic pain, but over the long term, we see these positive changes that improve uh, mood and uh, independence and function and also reduce pain as well. So why do we get these long-term changes? Well, one of the really exciting new areas of research is that exercise will actually change how our genes code for a number of these different factors. I used to think that genetics was genetics, whatever you're born with is what you get, but there's this whole new field of study called epigenetics where we're learning that the, the impact of our environments and our lifestyles can have huge impacts on how our genes um, code for things and how they express themselves. And so you get these epigenetic changes in uh, genes that code for information around, um, around pain, so those neurotransmitters and inflammation. With long-term exercise as well, you can also get a reduction in visceral fat mass, so you, you lose weight, and that visceral fat mass is responsible for production of inflammation as well. So the visceral fat is actually responsible for production of about a third of our interleukin-6. So if you reduce your visceral fat, you actually reduce your systemic inflammation. And they think that that's why we get all these, or one of the reasons why we get all of these positive benefits with exercise on reducing dementia, reducing risk of cancer and heart disease, etc. And then the third thing that happens with regular exercise is that we get an improvement in the brain circuitry and the brain uh, connectivity in parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, talking to a part of the brain called the reticular formation that basically enhances that descending inhibition um, of pain, of those nociceptive signals. So you get improvements in that neuroplasticity that people have been mentioning. So the movements, and it seems like regardless of what type of movement you do, can improve that descending inhibition. And this is a fairly new area of research, so our understanding of this is, is growing and has been growing over the last couple of years. All right, so yay, everybody go and exercise. Well, and it's just that easy, right? No. <laughs> So as far as what amount and type of exercise you should do, the Public Health Agency of Canada is saying that for general health and well-being, 150 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous exercise per week is, is what they're recommending. So raise your hand if you think that that is terrifying. Okay, good. You're, you're, I'm not alone then. <laughs> um, so 150 minutes per week of exercise, a couple times a week of strengthening for muscles and bones, and, and moderate to vigorous. So that's a lot of exercise, and the majority of people with chronic pain would run screaming out of the room if, if you say that's what you should do. Um, the good news is, though, that list of hundreds and hundreds of studies that I talked about of the benefits of exercise, almost none of them are getting people exercising at this 150 minutes or more. So that's awesome. You get benefits even with less exercise. So, for some people, and, and others have mentioned it here as well, the last presenters talked about the, the motor imagery or just imagining what uh, physical activity would be for you and, and a very detailed imagining of what you would do and how your body would move can have an impact on your brain functioning and on your pain. So for some people, exercise may be closing your eyes and imagining a movement because you may be bedridden or you may be too sore to move. Uh, for other people, exercise may mean interrupting your sedentary time, setting a timer every hour and standing up, just going through some of the gentle movements that we did today, doing a few deep breaths, and just starting slow and, or low and going slow. So exercise doesn't have to mean going to a gym and sweating, and it doesn't have to mean going to a class. It just means beginning to move and gradually building up and preferably trying to build up to this amount because then you're going to get all the benefits for, for disease reduction as well. All right. Um, another thing here that I should recommend too is that 
the more frequently you're doing this, so if you're doing it on a daily basis, it becomes a pattern for your body, and, and others have mentioned earlier as well, of that change in the brain connectivity. So the more you practice freedom of movement, um, the better it is for that, that brain plasticity and the brain regeneration. All right, so where do you begin? First of all, with your choice of activity, make sure you have several options, because if going for a walk with your dog is your activity of choice, and we've got a thunder and lightning storm going on like we had last week, or it's hailing, or there's a blizzard, you're probably, that's going to be a barrier to you exercising. So make sure you have several options that are fun, accessible, affordable for you. Um, usually better to begin with something that's more aerobic rather than resistance, particularly any eccentric contractions, so the ones, the contractions that lengthen your muscles, um, those tend to be a little bit harder on people with central sensitization. But begin with basic just freedom of movement, trying to move in a relaxed, uh, thoughtful way. So you can start off by determining your tolerance. So for example, if you choose walking, that's an easy one for me to describe here, if you choose walking as, as one of your activities, you determine how much you can do before your pain really starts to flare up. So say you're one of those uh, fortunate people that can walk for half an hour, but then if you walk for longer than that, you really start to feel it. You become, your back is more sore, your legs are more sore, um, your pain goes up and it lasts for a few hours. Well, you shouldn't walk half an hour then. That's, you don't want to push yourself to the point where you're exacerbating your pain, but you can begin at half that, and that's the amount that you start with. And exercising on a regular basis, and it might be daily or it might be every other day, um, but keeping at that level for several days, maybe several weeks, until you feel that you can increase, but only increase by about five to 10%, so small increments. So if you can exercise or walk for 30 minutes before things flare up, then you would start with 15 minutes, and after a few days, you'd go to 16 minutes. So it seems like tiny, minuscule amounts, but basically just think of yourself as retraining your brain, retraining that central sensitization, and you're giving yourself that polypharmaceutical cocktail of anti-inflammatories and, and pain relievers. And then this other one, that's this last point here, um, can be a bit of a challenge. Basically, you want to participate regularly. So you don't base your participation on your symptoms. You participate with modifications if necessary, but you stick to your schedule. So if you've decided to exercise daily, then you exercise daily, even if you're having a rotten day, but you modify things and change things. So, you, so I'll talk about what those modifications may be, if I can change the slide. I guess I'm pointing at the wall. I should be pointing over here. Um, so the types of modica modifications that I mean, you can do the same exercise but really reduce the load if you're feeling really sore that day. Or you can change your body alignment or your body position. Another type of modification would be to choose a different exercise. So you can unload the part of your body that is sore. So for you with pelvic pain, it's hard to unload the pelvis when you're doing exercises, but it may mean that you're doing something with your hand um, or doing something with your feet, but you're trying to, to let this part rest. Um, so you don't need to exercise the body part that's sore in order to get the benefits of exercise. You can also add psychological strategies, and this I like the, the therapeutic movement uh, description before. Did I use the right terminology for that therapeutic movement? Sorry. Okay, Patrick, yeah. Um, so I like the, the um, kind of the mindfulness component that's incorporated into their, their exercises that they're talking about. And same with Linda's uh, description of her therapeutic yoga before. There's a lot of mindfulness that's involved with that. Um, so you can include psychological strategies if you're safe to perform the exercise. So for example, if you're doing some sort of weight lifting routine, um, you need to be able to safely do the exercise as prescribed um, and not be doing any of these kind of weird alterations in your body mechanics to conduct it. And then if you can do that, you can add these psychological strategies to basically dissociate the fear of movement from the actual movement. So it might be mindfulness and being very aware of what your body's doing, or it might be distraction. Both work for people. Um, it may be deep breathing or visualization as you're going through the exercise. The third thing, you, or the fourth thing you can do too is add physical or preventative and sometimes pharmaceutical strategies as well to help make your exercise more comfortable. So I wanted to show you what, um, 
in a research project that we're currently working on right now, what we're calling the four P's framework for planning around pain management with exercise. So you need to be very intentional about this, not just exercise and hope it goes well. Plan for this ahead of time. Think about what you can do before, during, and after your exercise session using these four P's. So psychological strategies, physical strategies, preventative strategies, and pharmacologic strategies if those have been prescribed or recommended for you. Um, so for example, before exercise, just doing a, a nice um, gentle 15 minute warm up might be, or five minute warm up, whatever works for you might be a good physical strategy to use ahead of time. Um, pharmacologically, you may be taking your scheduled medications at the time that they've been prescribed. Psychological strategies, maybe you choose distraction and listen to a podcast while you're exercising or use exercise adaptations or use braces or splints to prevent pain. Um, after exercise, you may cool down using a mindfulness, just a uh, mindfulness practice, um, or you could use a thermal um, uh, warm pack or cold pack after the exercise to reduce pain. So if you're intentional about it, if you think about these things, talk to healthcare providers that are working with you and get ideas or recommendations for, uh, for these strategies and be very intentional about, your pain, intentional about your pain management with exercise. All right. And finally, I just want to remind people that if you have been given specific instructions about exercise or pain management, make sure you're following those and then you can talk to your healthcare providers about whether you can add additional things or take things away if you don't find them effective. Um, and pain self-management is not push through it. Absolutely not. We've heard that multiple times today. It's not no pain, no gain. I'm absolutely not saying that you should exercise despite all of your symptoms. I'm saying work with your symptoms and be very intentional, intentional about managing your pain because your pain certainly does matter and it needs to be minimized while you exercise. All right, so the main takeaways are exercise does more than just improve your physical function and your strength. It's a great pain reliever and anti-inflammatory. Um, and of course, those benefits are increased over time and the more regular you exercise. Um, however, remember that pain relieving mechanisms can be impaired in people with chronic pain, so you, you need to be patient with yourself and you need to progress slowly. Um, and the most important and exciting thing about my talk, I think, is that long-term exercise improves the neuroplasticity of the brain. Um, but be very careful to uh, be intentional about your pain management uh, with exercise. And that is my talk. I do want to make one other comment here. That we do have a pain management web page um, at saskatoonhealthregion.ca. There was some discussion earlier about what resources are available for people with chronic pain. And our services in Saskatchewan are abysmal. And uh, please advocate to the government uh, as much as possible. Write to the health ombudsman and say this is appalling that we lack essential services for people with chronic pain. Um, so you can actually put complaints into the health ombudsman. Um, so uh, check out that webpage if you have questions about what resources are available. Um, I also want to tell you about SAS Pain. So there is a, we are a grassroots group of individuals who are advocating for better services for pain in the province. Um, so it includes uh, patients and families, um, multidisciplinary healthcare providers, healthcare administrators, educators, and researchers. We are now an, a registered charity as of last month. Um, and uh, so we are currently going through the process of, uh, well, we're writing up our first newsletter. So if you're interested, um, you can send me an email. Um, I think we do have an email connected with SAS Pain, but it's probably just easier to email me at susan.tupper at usas.ca if you'd like to be kept informed of SAS Pain's activities. And uh, we're going to be writing basically a provincial pain strategy. Um, also exciting, I'm part of a group that's uh, working towards a national pain strategy. And next Thursday, there's, our group has a meeting with uh, the federal government basically saying, um, and, and it was an invitation from the federal government um, to share what a national pain strategy would look like. So hopefully, similar to what's happened for mental health and the opioid crisis, there's been an influx of money to the provinces to address pain. Um, and so with significant 
input from our populations complaining about the lack of services and the need for multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary services for pain, um, we can hopefully make a change in this. Um, we are also, for SAS pain, we are also collecting patient stories. If you would like to share either a video clip uh, interview or um, just write a brief description of your experience with pain. We're including patient stories in our advocacy pieces because those um, those really catch media's attention and they also catch the attention of government as well. So I can tell them everything about the, by, we can improve cost to the healthcare system if we have multidisciplinary services for pain and they don't listen. I don't know why. But, uh, and we can improve patient outcomes, they don't listen, but when you give a story, that has more clout and impact. So if you do have a story to share, please contact me, susan.tupper at usas.ca, and I would be very happy to, uh, um, to hopefully use uh, your story or a part of your story in our advocacy as well. And that's all I have to say, so I welcome your questions. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you know, exercise um, remissions like that are so normal for people with chronic pain especially, but also for people who don't live with pain. Unless you're an elite athlete and it's your job to exercise, everybody goes through those periods of time where they make gains and they're feeling really good about themselves and then something happens. A pain or a non-pain related barrier pops up and it can put you into that um, kind of that deconditioning <coughs> spiral, especially if you have to take a week or two off. Um, number one is don't beat yourself up about that. Just accept that it's normal, um, that it's kind of part of the cyclical process of exercise and think long term. Like don't worry so much about the day to day, getting it done every single day, but think around uh, long term uh, adherence to exercise. So if you do need to take a break, that's fine. Remember that exercise doesn't mean going to a gym or taking a class, it can be motor imagery, so imagining in detail, as much detail as you can, kind of a visualization of an exercise, what you would do. So you're closing your eyes, you're not moving, but you're visualizing what you would do and what it would feel like. It has not quite the same effects, um, but it can maintain some of the gains that you've had. And think of that as an exercise, even though you may not be moving your body. Um, some other innovative strategies as well, using mirrors, just going through gentle movements with a mirror in front of you that gives you that visual feedback um, in association with some of the, the other proprioceptive feedback that you get. And just accept that just gentle movement and interrupting your sedentary time is so beneficial and can be thought of as exercise. Um, yeah, the thing with housework is that you can kind of get distracted and you can kind of get sloppy around it, um, <laughs> which is fine, um, but it, you, you gotta be careful that you're not getting into kind of an overuse pattern. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with that. But if you can, if you can turn your housework into you know, gentle, careful movement, um, and it feels good, <laughs> then by all means, use it as part of your exercise, yeah. There was somebody else had a question, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Powerful brains that we have. Um, that's interesting. And it brings up another point too about the difference between distraction and, and mindfulness or the inward focus of mindfulness where you're aware of what your body is feeling. If you can't do that body scan without flaring up pain and anxiety, don't do it. Just take a break from that for a few days and do something that's more distraction focused. So that outward focus and outward vis visualization as opposed to the inward scanning. Um, so yeah, you have to kind of just work with what's happening, um, but just think long term for participation. And, and if you get a flare, that's okay. Let yourself be self accepting with that and know that you're going to get back on track. Yeah. Oh, good. Sure. <laughs> um, this is kind of a question for my spouse. So we've heard an anecdotal evidence from a few people that swimming can be an effective uh, modality for exercise because there's less pressure on the body. Yes. Is there any research data to back that up? Um, so I, I was part of a, a group of authors that did a systematic review on that for people with fibromyalgia. So I don't know in the, in the chronic pelvic pain world, but with the interesting thing about the nervous system is that it kind of, once you hit the nervous system, it works the same. Whether you have, or sorry, once you hit the central nervous system, whether you have fibromyalgia or chronic pelvic pain related to endometriosis or rheumatoid arthritis or migraines, once those mechanisms um, are altered, it doesn't really matter what's happening in the body tissues, it works the same. Um, so the, the, for people with fibromyalgia, and I would expect that you'd get similar responses for people with chronic pelvic pain or inflammatory bowel disease or migraines, um, there's no difference in effectiveness of exercise that's done on land or in water. Um, so Potentially, there might be something different with, with chronic pelvic pain because of the pressure on the viscera. I don't know, maybe. Um, but, you know, for, for other chronic disease types, it seems that just movement, regardless of the type of movement, is what you're looking for. Um, so it's interesting. There's animal studies that have compared um, voluntary exercise to involuntary exercise. So if you allow a mouse to run on a running wheel, they get all of these lovely benefits and it can prevent the development of chronic pain. If you take a mouse and you drop it in water, so it's a forced exercise, they need to exercise, but they also get a stress response, they don't get any of these positive benefits. They get an increased inflammation as opposed to a reduction in their inflammation. So just keep that in mind when you're planning your exercise program. Don't force yourself to do it just because you said you would exercise today. Um, it's got to be fun and enjoyable and it's got to be comfortable for you. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for listening and for hanging around for the rest of the day. I think I might have gone a little bit over time, but uh, we did start late, so I'll give myself some leeway for that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, we're going to do a couple more door prizes here. Um, uh, here.
solar, it's just, oh yeah, it's on, okay. <laughs> Hello, so my name is Natasha Salash, and I'm a sex and intimacy counselor, a body sex facilitator, and I also am an orgasm and pleasure coach for women. Um, my work, uh, <laughs> it's often non-conventional, but it's, it ranges from traditional talk therapy to um, facilitating nude workshops with women um, that are based on overcoming body and sexual shame. So there's a wide variety in what I do. A key component to it is shared vulnerability. I don't approach my work as if I'm all-knowing and I'm above where the woman is at. I work with women. Um, and and it's, it's more of a support, supporting or coaching role. That's how I like to, to view it. So I've, I follow a holistic model of care, which um, really emphasis, emphasizes looking at the woman as her, as her whole self. So looking at physical, emotional, spiritual, sexual, and intellectual parts of her. I think they're all part of it. It's, it's really care of the mind and body, and looking at it as a way of integrating them all together. Um, what shows up physically often has an effect on how we feel emotionally, and how we feel emotionally often has an effect on what shows up physically. So I think it's really important to look at the whole picture of it. So to sort of explain what I mean by this, <clears throat> I like the imagery of wheels. I, I think in or circles, I think in terms of circles often. Circles to me represent wholeness, um, unity, and I, I really, my, part of my philosophy too is that I'm, it's not about fixing anybody. I don't believe that anybody's broken. I don't even use the word healing um, because I, I think it's more about integrating. It's more about looking at all of these parts and connecting them together, allowing them to flow together. So um, I have, I'm a mother of five children and, and I have a personal story that sort of helped me to come to this realization. One of my daughters was adopted as an older child and I could see her constantly trying to prove that she was worthy of being loved and everything. And it dawned on me that she believed she had to be perfect to be lovable and whole. And so part of my process in in mothering her was showing her that she was loved as she is and I don't think she needs any fixing. So I kind of carry that philosophy into my work. We are who we are and I don't think any of us needs fixing. As I said, it's about connecting these parts in our circle. So some of the women who I work with have experienced trauma, different kinds of trauma. It could be past physical or sexual abuse, could be trauma from the medical procedures they've experienced trying to decrease the pain from endometriosis or other things. Um, trauma from re feeling rejected with their, in intimacy with their partners, feeling like they're not enough, like their body isn't working properly. And when they, as a way of coping with this trauma, they often disconnect from parts of their body. And I, I heard that a reference to disconnecting to your legs earlier too, and I thought, yes, that's exactly what I see. And often that part is their genitals, the, their genitals, complete disconnect. Women will even say, you know, it's like there's me, and I know who I am, but there's this whole other part that I don't even, I don't know at all. And once the, it's, a, it's an incredible actually self-preservation thing to do to, to disconnect, because you almost need to in that moment to save your life in the trauma. However, once the, the experience of the trauma has passed, to continue that disconnect takes an incredible amount of energy. It's like, a, to me, a process of resistance or pushing or pulling. And, and that, in itself, can cause pain. So, again, with the integrating of this circle, it's lessening the resistance and the pushing of the separate parts and allowing them to connect. Um, 
So just I'll quickly go through the different spokes and sort of how I see them. Um, when I work with women, I, I, I don't necessarily use these words. Everybody has different words that resonate with them. Um, but these give a general idea. So physical, your physical body, movement, um, what you eat, everything you do physically. Spiritual, it's a loaded word, but at, to some people it means religion. Some people it's just a still quiet place. It's a walk by the river. It's whatever you do, a practice just to center yourself. Intellectual is mind, understanding, cognitive understanding, logic. Emotional is your feelings, how you feel, how you experience feelings and emotions. Sexual is your sexuality. Um, to me, I, I put it at the center and not everybody would, but because a lot of my work focuses on sexuality, um, I kind of think often it can be a great gateway for the other parts. So I, my support with women is to help them to feel safe enough to allow the flow and integration of all these parts. <clears throat> and again, it's, it's nothing to do with healing or fixing. So how do I do this? Well, um, I call this the wheel of support. Um, and I made this one, I created this one particularly for women dealing with pain that involves, I mean, like endometriosis or sexual pain, pain that um, inhibits the ability to in experience sexual pleasure. Um, and, and it doesn't always have to be doing that, but that's what this wheel is about. So um, I, I put each spoke is a sort of different element that I see when working with women who have these concerns, who come to me with these concerns. And I'm just going to share a little bit about what it would look like working with me. But again, um, it's different for everybody who works with me. And some people want more traditional talk therapy and some people want to, do, to work differently. So it's always very consent based and what, based on the level of comfort with the woman. So body image, accurate understanding of sexual anatomy, internal and external. I find a lot of women will come with vulvodynia or different, um, different uh, things uh, like endometriosis, anything, but they don't fully understand their sexual anatomy. And they'll say, oh, and a doctor said, oh, that looks interesting. And they've completely internalized this as something is messed up down there. So we go, what I actually do, if the women would like, and this comes back to shared vulnerability, is we actually together, naked, with a mirror, look at our genitals and identify all the parts of our sexual anatomy. And the reason I do this is because a lot of the women have laid on tables naked in front of healthcare providers endless amounts of times with tons of people seeing them, but nobody's ever done it with them. So I just think this is the least I can do, and it also gives them an accurate um, picture of what another woman looks like naked, and they're often just incredible relief. Oh, it's not all messed up. I, I look normal down there. And again, normal is a wide range of normal. So I call this genital show and tell, <laughs> and it can be an incredibly he healing, for lack of a better word, an emotional experience. So it's really powerful. Um, and I think that how a woman sees herself in this area of her body can really affect how she feels about herself. We're raised as little girls to please, to look pretty, but not be too sexual. And I think when uh, a part of our sexuality feels compromised, it can, we can take that on as compromising our whole identity, who we are and what we have to offer. So um, I think we really need to go to, to those places to explore those beliefs. Um, and again, like I said, the women I talk to often t speak of this disconnect between their genitals and themselves. And it's often a deliberate um, disconnect. So. Part of that is identifying the sexual anatomy. We even name, name our vulva. So it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's like, 
hmm, you exist and you're here, hello. So that's part of it. Okay, pleasure, next one. So living with ongoing pain can affect our ability to enjoy pleasure. Pleasure is a bit of a loaded word. People often think right away, sexual pleasure, pleasure is equated with sex. And that's definitely a part of it, but I think that's really limiting. Um, pleasure can be experienced through our five senses. Tasting, smelling, touching, seeing, hearing. Uh, and by expanding our idea of pleasure and how we can experience pleasure, we can go beyond kind of the penetrative sex model of sexual activity. And a lot of women will complain that their, say, male partners aren't understanding, that it hurts to have penetrative sex. And, and, and that's, that's, I understand that as well, but I, I think that, again, the male partners might not understand that there is a whole world of pleasure beyond, again, penetrative sex. So helping women look at pleasure as something beyond just your genitals. Um, you can, I don't know, if you walk down the street sometimes and you'll smell something and it's like this boy, you like the smell of a boy in high school when you're 17 or something and you're just like flooded, your senses are flooded. Our senses are really powerful. So I, it, helping women look curiously beyond what they, what they think they know. Um, in order for pleasure to be felt, we need to be really relaxed. I, you guys have heard a lot about the nervous system today. Relaxation is the foundation for sexual pleasure. And often women will say, oh, but I was relaxed. You know, it's my partner, I was relaxed. But we can think we're relaxed and we're not really. If our mind is running like, this might end up hurting, or I have to do the dishes later, or my body looks ugly, we're not relaxed. We're in our mind, we're not in our body. For our body to be com completely settled, it's, it's, it's our, it takes a, a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot. And it's largely controlled by our autonomic nervous system, which is it's unconsciously sending single signals through our body. But we can help it. We can encourage ourselves to be relaxed doing different, different methods, which I help women work on. Um, but it's, it's really fundamental to learn to be how to be relaxed. And if we're afraid that we're going to be hurt or something's going to physically hurt, it's going to be very difficult to be relaxed in, in sex. Um, a, a really good explanation of how our autonomic nervous system works is if you're away at, like for a weekend and you have to have a bowel movement, but you can't. And it doesn't matter if it's like, it could be a girl's weekend and you're having so much fun, but you're like not at home and your body's not totally relaxed because you're not at home, you can't go. But like you turn the corner and you're a block away from your house and you just couldn't make it to the toilet fast enough. That's your autonomic nervous system knowing you're, you're relaxed at home. So it's much deeper level of relaxation than we realized. It's something I've learned working with women over and over again, how long it really takes to fully settle into our bodies and that there's no shame in that time. I, I take that time for myself, I deserve that time, we all deserve that time. So um, even though we have an idea that things, we might be trying to take time, often it's, it's a lot longer and that's okay to take the time we need to take to relax in order to be able to feel pleasure. Interpersonal relationships. Pain no doubt affects not only our relationships with ourselves, but those around us, often people don't try to step into our shoes enough to really understand our perspective. I'm a word geek, I love words, and the word understand is, I think, a really powerful word because it, it truly means to comprehend another person's experience so much that you're standing under them. And so, in working with couples, I, I really help facilitate this dialogue of understanding where she's at in her experience and also understanding where he's at. And so much of it comes down to assumptions and projections and feelings of hurt and rejection. But really, if to take that word to its heart that I want to know how you feel so much that I will stand under you. It's a, it's a beautiful word and I love supporting people in understanding. Shame. Shame literally means to cover and hide. 
and shame is is a deep belief that not it's not like guilt where I've done something wrong it's that I am wrong so it's, it's a very powerful feeling and the answer to overcoming shame is to uncover and, th and that's where like when I mentioned at the beginning nude workshops when you're naked there's nothing to hide behind it's it's incredibly vulnerable but then it's just you're there and it's there's no more oh they only love me because they don't see me well they see me and they're reflecting love back to me wow maybe I am okay so by uncovering this shame by expressing how we feel to our partners to support people to our friends that I feel like because of this that I'm I'm broken or something it's it's the beginning of a process of healing and I think it really connects with the intellectual piece of the circle that I was talking about um, where when we express our stories we share our stories we share the effect that they have on our, our on us um, it helps to lift that shame and I think there's also a level of a physical lifting of shame exposing ourselves exposing our bodies to our loved ones and allowing them to love those parts that we feel shame in and and by sharing our stories of shame and, and showing them we let go of the hold it has on us embodiment it's another beautiful word <laughs> um, because many of the therapies um, revolve around talking and expressing stories and feelings um, it's these are important and they nourish intellectual and emotional spokes on the wheel but I think most of us pain or not have such a disconnect with our bodies and who we are and I think this comes back to childhood when our children are climbing and playing and we say careful don't fall don't hurt yourself that's too high right there we undermine their ability to know what their body is capable of and we do it with good intentions but unless they have difficulties with impulse control they they innately know their stomach will tell them their body will tell them their limits and so yeah when we say that's too high we've we've taken that away from them we're teaching them not to listen to themselves so another way of saying it is listen to your tummy it'll tell you how high to go on that tree and they will they'll stop and the interesting thing is if you have kids you'll see the difference one kid can climb the whole tree and one can go two feet but it's like listen to your tummy so some of my work involves talking helping women to rediscover that body awareness that understanding of what it feels like to be embodied and trust it because when your body has what you may, might feel like rejected or failed you or hurt you so much it's like f you like I don't want to listen to you but actually the answer is in there when we're born there's no logical cognitive understanding it's all physical it's all in our body so in some ways I think it's learning to come back to that before it was it was taught we were taught to do something else and in that it helps us to integrate those parts um, to, to help women do this there's different again different avenues it's a lot of it is mindfulness it's really interesting because all these things kind of come back to the same thing which is excites me these sort of principles for life but it's a lot of it is mindfulness breath um, awareness a lot of touch I really believe in self-touch doesn't have to be sexual but any kind of self-touch skin is the largest organ in our body most underutilized the more that we touch the more we feel the more we become aware of our physical self um, and and the more our touch the better it feels for other people because it's coming from embodiment rather than kind of like emptiness so that's embodiment so yeah that's kind of the wheel of support so um, and of course I mean different women come and I learn from them another way that they need to be supported and 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 that can change and that's the beauty of of my work I think is that it's adaptable and it's unique to each woman um, but these are the things that really came up for me when I was thinking about the women I've worked with around pain and shame 
and the difficulties that how that affects their relationships. And that's about it. Like I said, um, I I do one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, counseling sessions. I do sessions with couples, um, and then I do private work with women. Um, I don't really ever, I, none of my work really involves much touch or anything. It's mostly women for themselves. Um, and then I also do retreats. But um, yeah, I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? I always think it's good when there's tears because it just, it's all about feeling more. I don't think it's better or worse, it's just feeling more. So, and I was very nervous thinking, oh, it's academic. So thank you for being a nice audience. Yeah.